Good morning and welcome to the Historic Site Preservation Board meeting, City of Palm Springs, Tuesday, October 9th, 2018. May we have the roll call, please? Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, Member Marsh is not here. Member Kaiser is excused. Member Dixon is excused. Member Lavoy? Here. Member Hayes? Here. Member Burkett? Here. Chair Johns? Hey, here. <laughs> you have a quorum. Okay. All right, and the report on the posting of the agenda, please, Ken. Mr. Ch uh, Chair, the agenda for this meeting was posted in, for public uh, review at the City Hall Bulletin Board and at the Planning Department counter in accordance with state law. All right, thank you. And on the acceptance of the agenda, I think we'll take a motion to accept it as um, uh, presented with the caveat that if uh, City Council Member Roberts, Roberts. arrives, we'll uh, uh, adjust for his presentation. Thank you. Does that work? All right, thank you. Second. Lavoy and Hayes. All right, thank All you. All in favor? Um, vote. You need to vote. Oh, oh, <laughs> so annoying. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Keeping me honest, Bill. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, this time has been set aside for members of the public to address the Historic Site Preservation Board on agenda items and items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Although the Historic Site Preservation Board values your comments pursuant to the Brown Act, it generally cannot take any action on items not listed on the posted agenda. There will be three minutes assigned for each speaker. <coughs> Testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the hearing. We do not have a public hearing this morning, so if you are here and would like to address the board, now would be the time to do so. We'll open the public comments. Anyone, please come forward. Good morning, please introduce yourself for the audience at home and here at the table. Uh, good morning, my name is Barbara Marshall. I'm with the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation and I have an item that I would uh, consider just as general interest uh, for you and the public. Um, it is fall and that means Modernism Week Fall Preview. And the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation is excited to have a uh, great schedule this morning for everyone. On Thursday the 18th, we have a tour of the Frank Sinatra Twin Palms Estate. Uh, and while that uh, is nearing sold out, we encourage everyone to get online and get their ticket. Uh, on Saturday, we're really uh, thrilled to have three steel houses on tour. Two of the steel houses that we have on our tour are rarely available for touring to the public, so it's a great opportunity to get to see these steel houses. On Sunday, the 21st, we have our free lecture series. I emphasize that, free lectures. The first lecture in the morning is Gary John's wildly popular Lost, Saved, and Endangered uh, lecture. And then later that morning, we'll be having a lecture on <coughs> concrete screen block, the power of pattern. I know that sounds like a dull subject, but it really is a lot of fun. Uh, I know if you go online and you see that events are sold out, please don't be disappointed because we always have been able to accommodate a small number of walk-ups at the door. So uh, we look forward to seeing everybody at Modernism Week Fall Preview. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the audience wishing to address the board during public comments? All right, seeing none, we will close the public comments. Um, Staff, do either of you have an extra pen? I have literally just gone completely dry on. Thank you so much. Alrighty, uh, on the consent calendar, um, the approval of the minutes. Um, have we all had a chance to look over the minutes and make any uh, adjustments or changes? Any comments? I do have a few notes here somewhere. Um, yeah. Anybody? No. no? no. All right. Uh, Move to accept the minutes. All right. Um, okay. Um, all right. Uh, under, under discussion on those minutes, I do have two notes um, that I would like to, uh, they're not necessarily changes, but I am curious. Um, <clears throat> Uh, last month in September, we had Sandcliffe before us and the uh, consideration on the painting of the air conditioning units. Uh, the applicant proposed a beige color to match the buildings 
and Mr. Lavoie suggested an alternate color, and we did um, uh, create a subcommittee to look into that. And will we get some update from that subcommittee today? I'm just curious. I can provide you an update on that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, my next uh, question was, uh, at last month's meeting, um, there was a considerable amount of discussion about the removal of mature palm trees along Palm Canyon Drive in front of the new uh, development at Mesquite and Palm Canyon Drive. Uh, fast forward 30 days later, that project is almost nearing completion, and I think the city should be commended for the size of the tree that they put back in there. That was very good. And also, uh, I had made it some, I had expressed some concerns about the Mesa Gatehouse uh, and my concerns about it not being fully protected from the construction site next door. Uh, and I did follow up with uh, Flynn since then. But yes, no, the gatehouse is completely uh, enclosed in its own construction fencing. And so that is, um, I think, safe during the construction of the project next door. Ken, one item here, uh, when we also talked about um, the Del Marcos Hotel and their uh, improvements to their parking and a new wall that was uh, constructed there to replace an old wood fence, um, the notes call it a screen wall. I don't know whether it's really a screen wall. It's, it's really a wall. A privacy wall. Right? Yes, a privacy wall or, yeah. All right, so um, those are my only comments. Um, uh, seeing no further discussion, acceptance on the agenda. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, may the record show that um, Member Marsh has joined the... Uh, yes, committee. all right, thank you. Vincent, welcome. Good morning. All right, uh, number two on our agenda is public hearings, and we have none this morning. Under unfinished business, we have none this morning. But we do have some new business, item number 44A. Uh, the City of Palm Springs owner for approval of minor modification to the west facade of the Palm Springs International Airport, a Class I historic site located at 3400 East Talkwitz Canyon Way. Um, staff report, please. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The administration at the airport is proposing alterations to the west facade of the Palm Springs International Airport, which, as you know, is a Class I historic site. The um, primary uh, part of the building which uh, received this designation is just the west facade. It's not the entire terminal building or any other parts of it. Uh, in your packet this morning and uh, on your slides here, there are two uh, components to this project. Uh, one is the removal of a non-original door that you can see in this particular photo. The top shows the door as it exists today, and the bottom shows what is proposed. This is a door that was installed um, several years ago when there were some offices built uh, on the inside of the terminal. This is basically the baggage claim wing. And the um, airport is reconfiguring that space in order to increase the capacity in the baggage claim area and to make the circulation flow around the uh, car rental desks more um, smooth. So the office is being uh, eliminated and therefore the door can go away as well, returning this portion of the facade back to the way it was originally. The second part of this project is a relocation of an existing door to the next structural bay. So what you see in the photo on the left is that's where the door presently is. And you can see the red dashed line. And that is where the door is proposed to be relocated. So the mullion system, the, gla the glazing, and all the components that you see that are part of the existing curtain wall will be carefully disassembled and relocated so that when this door is in its new location, the uh, curtain wall and the glass uh, storefront that you see there will be uh, continuous uh, as it uh, currently exists in its current condition. Uh, just to help you understand, and again, both of these are happening on the um, baggage claim portion, uh, but this uh, exhibit shows you the uh, area where the offices are and where the door is being uh, moved to. And 
that one shows where the door is being removed. So that uh, completes my presentation. Uh, Tom Nolan, the director of the airport, is here to answer any questions you may have. And the consulting architect, Jim Chaffee, is here as well. That completes my presentation. As you will note in the um, staff report, staff believes that this is a um, project that is um, approvable as a certificate of approval. It is improving the overall historic integrity of the west facade. And uh, the work is being done in a way that matches this or uh, reflects the Secretary of the Interior standards for treatment of historic structures. So I remain available to answer any questions you may have, and the applicant is here. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. Any questions of staff? Did Mr. Chaffee or Mr. Nolan want to come forward and greet us this morning? <coughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Jim. Board. Jim Chaffee, architect. Uh, thanks for having us this morning. Uh, we're excited about especially this one project that you see in front of you, and that's the removal of this uh, non-original uh, door. Uh, those were some security offices that were built in that location that are being relocated. And so consequently, along with the removal of the door, uh, that was an exit door, I guess, for the security people to go in and out to the outside. Um, but along with the removal of the door is the office space on the other side of the facade is going away. And so we'll be able to see through that glass again. Right now, if you walk along that, uh, that walkway to the baggage claim, uh, you can't see out of that original glass. It's blocked by drywall. So that's all going to come out, and it's going to restore that facade a lot. So we're happy with that. And the other one is kind of inconsequential, but um, there's some uh, revisions happening in the uh, uh, car rental area that are going to require uh, the relocation of this uh, sliding electric exit door. And, uh, I don't know when those were installed. They're obviously not original, but uh, we're going to pick that up and just move it over uh, a couple of bays and put it uh, where you see in the on the right side there. Uh, doesn't affect anything really. It just uh, allows us to expand uh, a car rental booth that is uh, that is in that location. Any Happy to answer any questions. Uh, there's lots of other improvements going on inside the terminal as part of a new uh, renovation project that we're working on. It's going to really uh, upgrade things. We're working with uh, uh, Mr. Roberts. He's part of the uh, subcommittee on that. Maybe he'll share some of that with you later. Jim, I have a couple of comments. Yep, sure. Um, this feels similar to the work that was done at the J.W. Robinson's building, where some doors were changed or glazing was, was uh, altered to adaptively reuse the space and all. I think it's a, it's a good project. Uh, it certainly would um, not to the lay person indicate that these changes were ever made. You know, several months from now, they'll look like they were always there. Sure. Um, I had a question of staff. Um, you know, I have been here on this board for five years plus, and I do recall uh, other projects that came before us relative to the airport, and um, there was discussion about these columns here on the front of the building, these uh, squared off columns that hold up the, the col uh, not the column, but the uh, ceiling uh, beam. Thank you. Um, and I remember that there was some discussion that uh, there could very well be under those boxed in columns the steel needle points that are similar that hold up the, the, the main entrance to the airport. And I remember also a conversation that um, they would stay the way they were until such time that there were any alterations made to the west facade. And at that time, these columns would be uh, exposed. Am I the only person with that memory? So just some thoughts on that. Tom? Jim, I'll switch the seat with you. Okay. Good morning, Tom Nolan, Executive Director of the Airport. By the way, thank you to everybody around the table here. We're hitting historic record traffic. Two million passengers Fabulous. last year. We're about 10% over that this year. Extraordinary. And this is a reason for the impetus. I remember about seven, eight years ago, Chris Mills and I standing out in front of the building with Mr. Wexler. And that was when we were doing the ticket modification project, which is scheduled now for 2020, summer of 2020, that we would do some modifications to expose those metal columns underneath there. 
And unfortunately, that, uh, that did change in the respect that we are not dealing with any major revision to the facade in that area. If you recall, during the ticketing wing approval by the city council, they decided they did not want to do any bump out of that front facade. So that work went away, therefore we couldn't do the column work then. This interior remod, uh, just for functionality, I'm not sure we would consider that a major project, but we do, <coughs> but we do have a major project in about two to three years for a, car, a, a completely new car rental facility, which would go out across the street where that hangar is. It would be a multi-level parking deck and to be able to house the 800 to 1,000 cars that we need during peak demand in the season. Once that project is done, the entire baggage claim interior will be remodeled. That might be an appropriate time to build within that uh, some type of modification to expose those beams, yeah. right? But th this small door move, I'd, I'm not sure, is what you would call a major facade right. change. It's it just... I'll remove the word major from it. <laughs> I'll take the word major out of it. Um, I remember, and it, I'm pretty certain it was this board, it might have been a number of years ago, but there was the conversation about moving everything forward to create that interior That's right. additional space area. that mm -hmm. you needed. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident that this board or some makeup of this board uh, said no to that. And I believe that we did get the uh, support of the city council on that, and that's why all of the work uh -huh, is being sure. done on the inside. Um, you know, I would defer to staff, certainly, to uh, define this as uh, changes to the front facade that would warrant the uh, exposure of those columns. Um, and if not today, then certainly, uh, let's keep in mind what Mr. Nolan is telling us about projects down the road. And um, uh, we're very proud of this airport, and if with this increased traffic to it, I think that we only benefit from keeping it and enhancing its mid-century modern qualities, because as we know, so many people are coming here for that, and why not have the first impression of their arrival here be this dramatic uh, airport? So what we will do as part of your approval today is to tie the restoration of the columns on the exterior of the airport of the west facade to major projects in the future. And the first one coming up being the uh, changes to the baggage terminal end of the, uh, the airport. That would be a great time to do that. All okay. right, great. So okay. we'll go ahead and, and so tie I would it just that. ask the board here to remember this day. Or, <laughs> well, but no, but for in for a couple of years from now or whenever that might might happen, um, we'll and, memorialize these. And Mr. Lyon will also include that in our minutes for today. All right, excellent. <laughs> so you don't right. have to remember. <laughs> well, that's why I'm tasking the board uh, with remembering that. Any other questions of, of Tom and or Jim? Okay. Um, I'll accept a mo Tom, thank you very much thank you very for coming much. this morning. Uh, a motion? Approve as proposed. Second. And the second for Mr. Burkett. Any further discussion? Uh, Vincent. Second. Oh, well, no, we actually we have the second. No, we have the second, but <coughs> any further comments or discussions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank All you. Right. Good morning. All right. Um, our next item under new business is um, this uh, 4B. This is the City of Palm Springs for amendments to Chapter 805 of the Palm Springs Municipal Code relative to <coughs> procedures for alteration and demolition of historic structures and general revisions to historic preservation <coughs> standards. Um, staff report, please. 
Mr. Chair and members of the board, as you'll recall at last month's meeting, we gave an overview of the progress of the demolition subcommittee on changes to our historic preservation ordinance. And at that time, I also outlined general revisions to the historic preservation ordinance. We are happy to have before you today a copy of that draft ordinance for your review and comment and hopefully action. With that, let me go through the proposed changes to our ordinance. Again, just going back to our demolition subcommittee, they were tasked with two primary functions. Number one was to ensure that entitlements must be in place prior to the demolition of a structure. And then number two was to revise our current process for demolition and alteration review. The <coughs> subcommittee met five times between May and September, and they were also joined by members of the Planning Commission subcommittee who also have an interest in the topic of entitlements being in place prior to demolition. <coughs> In terms of the requirements for an entitlement prior to demolition, what we are proposing as part of this ordinance change is the following. Number one, that the applicant would need to come before the HSPB for a review of the demolition. Step two, they would then need to obtain entitlements for the new development. And then step three, they would need to obtain a building permit. Upon completion of those steps, we would then be able to issue a demolition permit. And so the key is tying it to making sure that the applicant has a building permit in place. And so that way, we aren't demolishing a building and leaving a site vacant for many years. The idea is that by tying it to a building permit, that indicates that typically the applicant has the financing to move forward with the project. Uh, what we would also need to do, in addition to making the proposed change to our historic preservation ordinance, is also have that same language in the zoning code. I think that would be helpful to have it in both places. And so that's an associated change that we as staff will be making here in the next couple of months. Moving on to the demolition process, as you're aware, our current definition of demolition, uh, if you will, is basically entire demolition, removing everything down to the foundation. What we are proposing as part of this process is a revised definition of the term demolition. And what that is proposed as is modification, alteration, or expansion of uh, more than 25% of the lineal footage of a street-facing elevation. So what we see from the street, essentially, or modification to 50% of the lineal footage of all elevations of the building or structure, or 50% uh, alteration to the cumulative area of the footprint, either removal or expansion of that. And so with this new definition of demolition, anything that exceeds those threshold amounts would then come forward to the Historic Site Preservation Board for review and action. Uh, in terms of the actions that you would be able to take, you could either take no action on the proposed demolition or else you could refer it for designation either as a class one or class two, and I'll get into that process in just a moment. And so with that, that substantially changes our process relative to demolition and particularly demolition of class three historic structures. Let me then talk with uh, general ordinance revisions. I don't know if any of you have done a remodeling project, you like change out the carpet in the room and find that you need to do other things. Uh, this is similar to that. In making these changes to our demolition procedures and our entitlement requirements, there's also the need to make some other uh, revisions and modifications to our historic preservation ordinance. And so what I would propose to you is that as part of this process, we also make those changes at this time. Um, this is the general organization. It's basically following the same organization that we have in place, but it's fleshing out areas that aren't currently described, adding criteria where we don't currently have them, and then also adding some additional standards that will help us in taking action on historic preservation cases. Let me go through some of the changes that we are proposing. Number one, and this has been a topic that we've discussed for a number of years here in the Historic Site Preservation Board, is we're changing the term historic site to historic resource. 
In doing so, we're then expanding what a historic resource can be. So it can include everything from the site, which would be any natural features, landscaping, garden walls, et cetera. A structure, which is defined as typically a non-habitable structure, such as a bridge, uh, a wall, um, a tower, things like that. A building, which is a habitable structure, so either a home or a commercial business. And it would also include an object. And so that could be anything such as a sign. Uh, it could be something such as the archway that we have on the orchid tree site. And so by changing that definition, it will hopefully eliminate confusion when we say historic site. Now we're saying a historic resource. And then in the designating ordinance, we're defining what that historic resource is and what really deserves protection. <coughs> In terms of our three different classes of historic resources, we are making a couple of minor changes. Number one, to the class one historic resource, this will be more aligned with what other cities call their landmark structures. What we are doing is proposing to revise the criteria. We'll have our st standard seven uh, items that we always have, but we're also proposing to include an assessment of integrity. Uh, as you'll recall, this is something that was requested by the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation several months ago uh, in some documentation that they provided to you. Um, I believe that documentation was presented to us by the Palm Springs Modern Committee. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, just uh, keeping me honest. Okay. Um, so that's all. Thank you. Okay. And so what we would do is for class one, it would have to have an assessment of integrity. For class two, we are expanding this. Currently, class two is basically structures that have been removed, um, such as the <coughs> Desert Inn, that is a class two historic site currently. Or uh, another example is uh, what's called the Mousy Powell House, William Powell's house, uh, which has been modified significantly and doesn't retain its original integrity. And so we would expand this to include anything that might be worthy of designation, <coughs> any significant structure that might be worthy of designation. One of the discussions we had recently was relative to the integrity of the William Holden Deepwell House. There were concerns on the part of the board and the city council that it had lost some of its integrity. And so what this change would do, it would allow us to take structures such as that and classify them as a class two, a structure of merit, where some of the integrity may have been lost, but still it's worthy of designation. And so again, the proposal is to expand that category um, and to uh, have some additional availability for us to designate structures under that category. In terms of the change to class three, as we've discussed here at Historic Site Preservation Board, we will change that from any structure built prior to 1969 to any structure that is older than 35 years. And so that would be one of the changes that we're proposing as a general change to our ordinance. Another thing that we are proposing is under the uh, establishment of the Historic Site Preservation Board and staffing for that board is that we designate a city staff member as a historic preservation officer. Um, later in today's agenda, I'll talk about that position, but for now, uh, let me just indicate that we would then designate a staff person as the historic preservation officer to be specifically tasked with the responsibilities associated with Historic Site Preservation Board. Um, as you'll recall, the City Council has given us funding for an additional position. Uh, that position would be the historic preservation officer, and I estimate that about 75 to 80 percent of the time spent with that position will be in historic preservation duties. So that will be nice for us to be able to designate a staff person particularly for that function. So that's another change that we're proposing. One of the things that our current ordinance lacks <laughs> is any discussion about the procedures for designation of historic districts. And so what I'm proposing to do is to add those procedures to our code, looking at procedures that other cities have established. In terms of the application, one of the things that we would require is that at least 51% of the property owners within the boundaries of that district uh, have a signature um, supporting the designation of the district. Also that we would require at least three neighborhood outreach meetings to talk about the boundaries of the district and what being part of the district would mean. 
We also establish criteria for approval. Again, we're using our seven basic criteria and then two additional new criteria in terms of the district being logical and in terms of making sure that we have a substantial number of contributing structures within the proposed boundaries of that district. And then we go on to add definitions for contributing resources within the district and then also defining non-contributing resources. Later on in the alteration section, we also talk about the criteria for modifications and alterations to contributing resources and non-contributing resources. So again, it's to clearly define not only for us as staff and you as the Historic Site Preservation Board, for, but for the general public. What does it mean to be part of a historic district and how are modifications processed? What are the criteria that we look at in terms of approving those changes? Another change is we are changing the terminology. We currently use certificate of approval to, to talk about alterations to designated resources. We're proposing to change that to something that's more standardized that other cities use, and that is certificate of appropriateness. We also don't really have any adopted criteria in our code in terms of the findings that you make for assessing alterations to designated structures. So we're proposing to add that. And then also adding language relative to maintenance requirements for historic resources. That's something that's been a discussion point here at Historic Site Preservation Board um, on a regular basis. And basically, by adding these maintenance requirements, it goes a little bit beyond the standard maintenance requirements that we have generally for properties in our zoning code. And it gives our code enforcement team additional authority to issue citations so that we can avoid the um, demolition by neglect situation that we see in some cases. And so those maintenance requirements would also apply to class three structures. So if we see a class three structure where there may be maintenance needs, um, we can give code or enforcement the authority to go ahead and cite under those standards. Uh, another one of the things that our subcommittee discussed was having a violation section. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail on this. What was included in your packets was what the subcommittee saw at their last subcommittee meeting in September. At that subcommittee meeting, they had requested additional changes. Unfortunately, Mr. Priest, our attorney, was not able to get those changes to me by the time that we published our agenda last week. And so I have a handout page for you here, which it discusses those changes. Um, in terms of the two types of action that can be taken under the violation section, the city can take, um, can issue both criminal penalties, which is a misdemeanor, and this is our standard uh, enforcement tool under code enforcement, uh, where we can assess penalties up to $1,000. In addition to that, what we're also adding is the ability to take civil action and assess civil penalties. Here is one of the changes over what the subcommittee previously saw, is that under civil action, we can uh, assess up to $1,000 per day for correctable violations. And so let's say that someone removes something from a site, takes down some siding, replaces windows, something or like, like that. That for that time period, until they get that corrected by going through the proper process, either through the Historic Preservation Officer or through the Historic Site Preservation Board, the city could cite them up to $1,000 per day under civil action. And then secondly, I believe we had a $10,000 per violation previously. Um, in Mr. Priest's research, he feels comfortable that we can cite up to $25,000 per violation for some action that would be irreversible. One of the key things as part of this violation section is really the next one, and that is the ability of the city to withhold any future permits either building permits or any certificates of appropriateness that the HSPB may issue for up to a three-year period. I think more so rather than the dollar fines that we could have available to us, it's the withholding of permits um, that I think will be a great tool that will help us in any unauthorized changes to designated structures or to class three structures. 
Uh, so those are the changes that are being proposed under the violation section. Again, I have a handout for you that outlines those proposed changes to the draft ordinance. One of the uh, other changes that I'm proposing is to clearly identify what the process is for historic preservation on tribal lands. And to clarify, this is for historic designation within the boundaries of the reservation or the checkerboard as people know it. Uh, there has been discussion about the, um, let's see, Todd, you and I were talking about this. What's the term that's used? The, um, no, it's, it's the historic area of the tribe or something along those lines, Formerly which, tribal excuse me? Formerly tribal no, actually, it's, they have a different historic, term for it. Historic reservation. Uh, no, 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 it's something else, but it describes basically the entire valley, right. the extents of where tribal <laughs> members have been in terms of their occupation of the valley. Uh, it's not that, <laughs> so I just want to clarify, this is only for what is within the boundaries of the defined reservation or the checkerboard. Uh, pursuant to the authority that has been granted to the tribe by the federal government and their own historic preservation ordinance and the recent contract that was adopted by the city, the tribe retains authority for designated on, designation on tribal trust lands, and so that is land that's owned by the tribe within the boundaries of the reservation, directly by the tribe, designation on allotted trust lands, and that is land within the boundaries of the reservation that is owned by a member of the tribe or often referred to as an allottee. However, the city may continue to designate on fee lands within the boundaries of the reservation. What we would do in those instances is we would route any proposed application to the tribe first, they would review that, and then give that back to the city to proceed under our own process. And so we have outlined that in the last section of the proposed changes in the draft ordinance. And again, that's to make it clear what the relationship is on uh, land within the boundaries of the reservation that's also within the city's municipal boundaries. Uh, and so hopefully that will help to clarify that process. One of the questions that comes up is with the proposed changes to our definition of demolition, and required historic site preservation board review, how will that alter our process? It's difficult to say how many applications we'll have coming before the historic site preservation board. Uh, one of the things that I pro provided to the subcommittee is looking at the permits that the building safety department has processed for additions and alterations to buildings. In 2017, there were 395 permits for additions and alterations. In 2018, they processed 311 permits to date. Uh, that is through the month of September, so that's without October, November, December. And so you can see that's basically the overall number of additions and alterations. The question is, how many of those alterations and additions would fall under our definition of demolition and would be applicable to class three structures. My rough top of the head estimate is just something along the lines of about 60% is what I would guess. Um, a certain percentage of those may be able to be reviewed administratively by the historic preservation officer. Uh, and so there would be a lesser percentage that would actually need to come forward to the historic site preservation board for action. But again, it's a little bit difficult for me to estimate how will this change the workload for the Historic Site Preservation Board. What I anticipate is that it will most likely require us to add an additional meeting each month. And so they would then be asking Historic Site Preservation Board members to be available for two meetings a month. Um, but again, it's something that we would need to look at once we have this process in place and then make adjustments accordingly to make sure that we're not holding up applicants as they're going through a process and to make sure that we also give you all as volunteers a manageable workload. And so those are things that we need to be cognizant of as we make changes to our ordinance and to the definition of demolition. One of the other things that we might need to take into consideration is more streamlined procedures for staff. So that might mean that maybe our minutes for Historic Site Preservation Board aren't as descriptive as they are now. That's something that takes us a long time. 
it also might mean that we may reduce the um, staff reports, the length of our staff reports. Um, we might go down to things such as checklists for rather simple reviews. Um, but again, that's something that we need to look at once the process is in place and once we have a better handle on what is the volume of applications that we'll be handling. So again, those are just other things to take into consideration as we look at changes to our ordinance. With that, that concludes my presentation to you. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have uh, and respond to any changes that you might like to see as part of the action today. Any questions of staff? Um, I just, Dick? Just one. Please. <clears throat> um, and then I'd like to make some comments. But right now, just uh, ask the question. Um, I think it's just that maybe I'm not understanding the wording of just one thing. On page one, under the definitions, and you go down to the third to the last line of that <laughs> paragraph, um, it, for some reason, I'm just, um, maybe it's because I've lived with all this too long. <laughs> but <coughs> is that stated the way that it's, um, as it's written, is that correct? Would you read the line, please? The, the term alteration shall not include the reconstruction or replacement of any feature of a historic resource with a su suitable substitute on a like-for-like -like basis as determined by the director. What this is intended to mean, if they, for example, an applicant is changing out the windows on right. a structure, not enlarging them, just changing right. them out for something that's perhaps uh, more energy efficient, that if it's currently a casement window, then it would need to be replaced with a casement window. Um, right. So that is what that line means, okay. is where you're just changing right. something that is not altering the character with a like-for-like -like right. Right. Okay. replacement, then that could be approved at an administrative or a right. staff level. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Lavoie. Mr. Chair. Um, um, on page one, an alteration um, is, is fairly complete. Um, but when you go back to page 14, exemptions, um, alterations to non-character defining features um, are exempt. So in, in, in the recent case of like the Bank of America, the lights that were replaced were not character-defining features, but the new lights that were proposed would definitely affect the resource in, in a favorable way, but they, they, they could have been horrible. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm always thinking about where I live, and they've got this long list of non-character-defining features that should we ever have the money, they would be happy to take away, but, the, you know, I, I'd want some reassurance that what gets put back is appropriate to the resource and not perhaps, you know, the HGTV <laughs> favorite this week. <laughs> One of the key things that the historic preservation officer will need to do as part of the assessment of uh, changes to a designated site is even if things are exempt from going to the Historic Site Preservation Board, there still needs to be an assessment. Do those changes impact the um, defining characteristics? So in the case of the lights on the Bank of America building, because they're being placed on the resource itself, while the lights may not be a, um, a, a character-defining feature, they are placed on the building, and that is a concern. And so in those instances where it may impact the resource, then the historic preservation officer would bring, bring those changes to you. And so that's really the intent. If we can perhaps restate that better, um, we might make some changes to that section to just indicate um, that no certificate of appropriateness is required where it has been determined that no impact to the character defining features will result. That, yeah, that would, okay. be, that would make me very comfortable. Thank you. Todd. So on that, what if you just changed it to re removal of non-character defining? Isn't that correct? 
Let's see. And uh, where? Under B, the, the section that Bill just <clears throat> mentioned. Yeah. On page 14, B5, if you changed alterations to to removal of. Oh, okay. Is that what? Yeah. Yeah, so okay. removal of non-character defining. So that way if somebody wants to just take something off, mm -hmm. but then if they wanted to add it, then it would fall under the other Yeah, section. we look at the impact. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That, be, that would make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> I have two other. Oh, oh, please, no, Todd, you have the floor. So under um, the violations section, yes, um, the handout that we got, uh, section C to subsection A, mm -hmm. um, until corrected, um, do, does that mean, so where it says $1,000 per day, should we not add until, I'm assuming that's a th until corrected? Yes, I think that's so what, what the it, intent was. And then under that same item, um, do we need to define what's correctable? Like if they tear down a garage, well they could rebuild the garage. So that is correctable. In the case of the one where they tore out the sec this middle section of the house, mm -hmm. they could conceivably rebuild the middle section of the house. So I guess my question is, what's defined as, or how do we define correctable? Okay, let's go ahead and do that as part of these revisions before we send this on to city council is define right. correctable versus <laughs> non-correctable. Um, and then we'll go back to Jim Priest and have him incorporate that in the violation section. Um, and we may also want to put that into the definition sections as well. So we'll go ahead and develop that and include that. Okay. And then, um, and I don't know if we need to do this right now, did we not in the subcommittee discuss like creating some sort of a consent calendar for these things? That yes, we did. And that would be an administrative uh, action on our part. It's not something that needs to be in the ordinance itself. Okay. So it's, it's more of an administrative thing that we would do. The idea being just for the rest of the uh, Historic Site Preservation Board, one of the things we talked about in order to help move the amount of, of applications we may have on your agenda is to be able to place things where there is no significant impact to the resource on a consent agenda so that you wouldn't have to have a discussion of all of those items. Um, and so that's one of the things that we had talked about in the subcommittee. But again, that's an administrative procedure. Okay. okay. Thanks. I, I have one other um, item to, to discuss. Um, now that we have a preservation officer, um, <laughs> could we add two... Um, one more item, and I don't uh, tell me whether it's appropriate or not, but if we could have a goal for the issue of plaques for class one designation uh, to be uh, completed within six months, I think we had that discussion before. Um, so there's not such a long wait as we, you know, just because of the workload that we've had in, in the past. I'd really like to see that in there because... I would recommend that we not put that in the ordinance itself, but rather that, again, is something administrative on our okay. part. We'll have what a gentleman's we, agreement then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, what we can do is indicate that the one of the duties of the Historic Preservation Officer is to um, uh, have plaques available for designated properties. Um, but in terms of the timeline, that's something that we would do yeah. administratively here at the board level. Right. Okay. Thank you. I have a few, um, if I might. Um, could you go back, please, uh, to the slide on the tribal's authority? Because this is where I'm really still in the dark. So the tribe retains authority for designation on tribal trust lands. <clears throat> they retain authority for designation on allotted trust lands. To the layperson, how do we know what is and what isn't? As a realtor, I know if something is a lease land or fee simple. But I think lease land now becomes something more than just lease land. It might be a tribal trust land or it might be an allotted <coughs> trust land. So if my next door neighbor comes to me and says, I want to get my house designated, um, 
I would say, well, gee, you know, we first of all, we have to figure out whether it's on a tribal trust or if it's an allotted trust or what, what, what tools will we have to help us understand what is and what isn't? You have the exact same tool that I have, <laughs> which is the map <laughs> that the tribe provides and updates on a regular basis showing what is tribal trust land, what is leased land, and what is fee land. In terms of leased land, leased land will be allotted trust lands. So that is where the land is still owned by a member of the tribe, but they have leased it to... And that's clear. I thought, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And then the tribal trust land... Tribal trust land will not be leased land. It is tri it's land that is owned directly by the tribe for the tribe's purposes, such as their museum site, um, and then land that they proactively develop on their own. And so, again, it's owned directly by the tribe, and it is not leased land it's unlikely that you will encounter tribal trust lands in your day-to-day -day duties as a real estate agent. So my recollection is within the last year or so, there was a, a class one nomination that came before the board here that was in the Twin Palms neighborhood. And the designation on that property was held up quite a long time because of, I think, just some general confusion. Um, to my knowledge, um, I'm sorry, Twin Palms is not along lease land. But this class one nomination was held up because it fell on an allotted trust or a tribal trust. Actually, that nomination, if you're talking about the home Schwartz, owned by the garrisons? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was on fee land. And that was the confusion, is that the tribe was asserting, no, we have authority on fee land. It's only through their recent adoption of their historic preservation ordinance and clarifying that process for us that they've decided that the city can go ahead and designate okay. on fee right. land. So that helps me a great deal. And so that will also help us by having this language in our historic preservation ordinance. In the future, we know that we can go forward with those right, types excellent. of nominations. Thank you. That's the clarification I needed. Uh, well, let me I just, just finish. Oh, but, 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 okay, please. please. <laughs> so then, so with that though, does it need to say something like formerly tribal land that's now fee land or something? Uh, that's we <laughs> we have the definitions for those three terms in the city's land use contract. Okay. Um, if you'd like, I'll see if we can just go ahead and carry those over into our historic preservation ordinance so that you don't have to go back and forth. So it addresses what Gary yeah. was concerned about. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Thank you. So then the other question that I had is, and it came up, um, uh, and I think it came up by name, uh, the Holden residence this morning as being, um, it was designated as a class one historic site. Um, there was concerns uh, at the board level and probably, and I think you just reminded us at the city council level, level over its integrity. And that it, if this integrity issue was indeed a, a bigger concern for the William Holden House, it might have only been a class two, if I understood that correctly. Would it not have just qualified as a class one strictly on the fact that William Holden had owned the house? The idea with this proposed change is that not only would we have to identify that it was previously owned by someone who is uh, significant, um, but that we would also have to make an assessment of integrity. Uh, and so th that would be a big change over how we do things currently. So it would have to meet not only significance, but also the test of integrity as uh, outlined in the Secretary of the Interior standards. And so that would make it more <coughs> difficult to designate as a class one structure, really giving it the landmark status. And that what we would probably do is designate it under a class two structure of merit. Hmm. And so that would be a significant change over how we do things today. Yeah, no, I think that is really significant. Um, uh, Anyway, I, I, is there any further discussion or concerns or comments from the board I, on that? I, I think uh, along those lines, I think maybe the Crocker Bank is even a better example um, of the designation class one that really 
would have fallen into probably class two. Um, I, I just think that, um, I, I really think that's a better example to cite from that standpoint because I understand where you're coming from. And with, I'm drawing a blank on the Crocker Bank. Yeah. Uh, well, smoke because tree, of the alterations. at the corner of Sunrise okay, and East Palm Canyon. Canyon. That were yes, done good. that were really quite more, much more significant. So I guess it's a matter of degree of significance is what we're really mm -hmm. talking about for the alteration. But in my mind, George Washington slept here has always been sort of an underlying uh, reason to have a property dis designated as a historic site. Mm -hmm. um, he could have slept in a tent. <laughs> On the side. But, but, I mean, and that's sort of a, 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 a standard or an ideal that I've always held. Mm -hmm. And not every house is going to have a celebrity uh, component attached to it. But in Palm Springs, we are fortunate that so many, you mentioned Mousy Powell and William, and William Powell. Now, that house certainly doesn't have any integrity issues anymore, but... Would it not qualify on its own because of the ownership of the house, but that integrity issues would overrule the ownership of the house and the, the parties that were there and the many, many people who came there and the governor came and visited them and slept there? The integrity issue is going to overrule that? And, and this might be something that you all as the board want to discuss here as part of your comments today. Um, if you feel that integrity is important for class one designation, or is it of lesser importance than significance? Um, it, okay. So that, again. I would say it's of lesser importance than significance. In a town like ours with the number, but that's just my opinion. That's just my opinion. So that's, I'm putting that out there. Because it caught me last night, and I did make some, you know, highlights here. And um, so I would like some further discussion on that. Um, Mr. Chair. Please. Um, so the, the Mousy Powell House, okay, it's, it's an historic site because something important happened there. But the, the remaining resource no longer looks anything like it did when those people were partying there. So to say it's a landmark is to imply that what you're looking at is what they looked at then. It's not anymore. So, I mean, it, it's, and, and, and sometimes historic sites are important because something important happened there, and the building that's on it has nothing to do with that, that, that event. And so, therefore, it, 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 it's sort of like if you define, when, when, you, when we define landmarks, we're defining the site as because something happened there the structure, because it retains its integrity, features. So when, when, when historic uh, designating documents get written, they, they talk about how the site resource responds to the different criteria. And, it, and, and it's then up to bodies like ours to say, it, it, it meets enough criteria to be a landmark, or it, it, it doesn't mean enough to be a landmark, but it's worth remembering and preserving, so therefore structure of merit. Um, to me, it's sort of like to call everything either a landmark or not dilutes what makes a landmark. I mean, it's sort of like, that's a landmark. No, landmarks are supposed to be important more important than just things worth preserving. <clears throat> Please, Todd. So let me just to make sure I understand. So right now, the Todd refers us to where oh, you're sorry, at. Sorry, uh, page eight, top of page eight, where it defines criteria, where it talks about yes. criteria. It says in a. Uh, exceptional historic significance and meets one or more of the, so what you're saying is now gonna to have to meet two. No, what oh. I'm saying is it has to meet one or more under section A, which is our standard seven right. that we've been using. And then it also has to meet B, which is the site structure building or object retains its integrity of design, 
materials, oh, workmanship, okay. location, setting, so feeling. So then it does have to meet so two criteria. Yeah, so so it has are, to meet so both of those. And so that, the B is what's the significant yeah, the, change. The B is the significant change. And that's really what I'm asking you here today is, is yeah. that what you want to do or would you rather omit the discussion of integrity? I feel that um, any one of these criteria that we have used up until now that have defined um, the actions of this board, for them to now be put in a secondary position with this uh, B overriding is, um, is the wrong way to proceed. I mean, I think it, 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 it should play a role, it should play a part, it should take, we should always take it into consideration, but for it to override or must accompany any of these other one criteria, I, I think that's much bigger issue here today than almost anything else we're talking about. And just to, because everybody is uh, waiting to jump into this conversation. <laughs> um, but but in, 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 in continuing the conversation, and I do like the George Washington slept here analogy, um, in this B, in this B on page eight, the site structure building or object retains its integrity of design, materials, workmanship, location, setting, feeling feeling and association as established in the Secretary of the Interior's standards. I think even though the Mousy Powell House may be altered beyond recognition today, the feeling of what happened in that house, the people who came in and out of the front door, that breathed the air space within that house, that, that slept there and ate there, I don't think that should be minimized because the front door was moved from where it is to somewhere else. I have the most respect for you, and your argument is sound, and I get that. But I'm concerned that this is an overriding, this is overriding, this B is, is too defining, it's too restrictive, it's, it's adding a layer of the arguments will just, well, it doesn't have the integrity. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, it doesn't have the integrity. I, I'm concerned about that being an overriding tenet of our previously seven criteria. Mr. Chair. Mr. Lavoie. Does that property still maintain its um, association? Are we talking about the Mousy Pal? Yes. I don't even know where the house is. <laughs> well, I really association, don't. I do not know association, the house. as I understand it, is associated with certain people. Yeah. So it does. Okay. So it would meet integ that integrity. However, oh, had, but see, I like that interpretation of see, it. See, but, but in five but, years, when none of us are sitting at this table. Yeah. Well, it, it's in here. It's association. That's that's a that's a well known preservation term. But what say, say what if they put what if someone had put a gas station on that site? What what would that and you're landmarking that site, and 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 the plaque might say this used to be the site of. Well then no absolutely Bill I don't see that as being a class one any longer if there so was a gas th station that, on that, there. That, that's why that's why. B is there. Yeah. Okay, so let's come back to the William Holden House, though, for a minute, because that is the subject that brought this all forward. That was the um, <clears throat> Class One nomination that, that raised the issue of integrity. Um, and yes, the home has been altered, the front of it, the elevation, more than 25% or the 50% of the street front of that elevation has been changed. But to make that a class two instead of a class one, and so those alterations to the exterior of that house override the fact that William Holden lived there, a well-known movie star, et cetera, et cetera. I just don't want 
the integrity issue to override the other criteria or what if a property came forward and it met four or five of the criteria and an argument made, well, no, sorry, the integrity is lost. Well, then those other five criteria are, are secondary. I just, I'm just, am I alone here that it's, it seems like it's overriding. It's, it's something that you can meet all five of these and then if, it's, if there's an integrity issue, nope, sorry. Um, let me explain. I, I voted no on that designation. I remember re that reluctantly. Yep. Because there thank was. Thank you for repeating the word reluctantly. There, there wasn't an, another tier to put it under. I, it's worth preserving. It's worth noting. It's worth remembering. But to me, it didn't. It didn't quite get to that threshold of landmark, and I had no place else to put it. The rest of you disagreed with me and made it a landmark, even though the integrity had been identified as not being what it was when the, he lived there. And, 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 and that's, that, that's sort of like the discretion of boards like this, to make those determinations that, yes, the, the integrity is sufficient to. It's not, so integrity is, 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 is not, a, not a yes or no quite often. It's there's enough of, as opposed to there's not enough or, or not enough of. And Mr. Chair, what I might recommend based on your discussion here is that on page 8 under 1B, we might word it such that the re site retains one or more elements of its integrity, such as um, materials, workmanship, location, setting, feeling, et cetera. That would make it a little bit less strong than okay. perhaps the way that right. you're seeing it now. And then that gives the board adequate discretion okay. in determining the right. integrity. Flynn, and I and I'll apologize if I cut in before Mr. Marsh, he had no. his hand raised. And I appreciate that. Vincent, hold that for just a okay. thought. I mean, and, and I don't want to minimize the importance of integrity. I think it's a character that we look for in people all day long. We like people who have integrity. I want my historic sites to have integrity as well. I just don't want the integrity issue overriding um, the other criteria that have defined our ordinance up until this point. So if, if, that, if that indeed does it, and if you wouldn't mind repeating that again in just a second, because I was okay. <laughs> already preparing what I wanted to say back and wasn't listening. Okay. All right. Um, Ken? The question that I would ask, uh, as you consider um, modifying the, the definition of a class two, is up until this time, class two sites have had no quote unquote protection because normally whatever's there has been so significantly modified, if it still exists, that it does not retain its quote unquote integrity. The distinction between class one and class two heretofore is that class one is protected. Class two is not. And I don't know if that same distinction is one that you want to carry forward or not, but the the ability to recognize sites of historic significance where the object or the structure or the building uh, is no longer there, such as the Desert Inn or the um, Potter Clinic or the uh, Shoal House uh, or the Indian Oil <coughs> Building, which has been so modified that it's no longer in the way it was originally. These are all class two sites the majority of which I just mentioned, the structure that was the historic structure is gone. Right. If, for example, the William Holden Deepwell House were to have been given Class II designation under our current ordinance, it would not be protected. Now, I'm the person who doesn't always argue about protection. I argue about the notion that does this particular resource help educate the public about our history. But the question that happens as you're looking at this revision and you're looking at changing the distinction of what is a class two 
is whether or not class two is going to have any type of protective status or not. Because if you follow this scenario, and if, for example, Holden Deepwell was to have been designated class two, the next day it could be demolished. And so I don't think that's where you want to go with this. No, <coughs> but I think it's just go. a question to raise. I think that bringing in the consideration or the evaluation of integrity is extremely important as you guys look at potential class one historic sites. Um, I think you just need to look at how you bring these distinctions together the way that, that Mr. Lavoie was saying is that I kind of don't have one in between, you know. Uh, well then, I, uh, again, I'm a fan of integrity, like it, hope I have some, <laughs> and uh, I just don't want it to override or disqualify a, a property that meets at least one of the other criteria. So, Flynn, if you if you noodle that language again, if you don't mind, please, um, how it might relax that. Uh, um, yep, yeah, certainly. Please? Um, just as we do under A, under B, what I would propose is that the site structure, building, or object retains one or more of the following elements of integrity, design, mm -hmm. materials, workmanship, location, setting, feeling, and association. Okay. So something along those lines. No, and I'm happy with that. But um, <coughs> uh, again, my George Washington slept here. Is that in location, setting, feeling, or is, is that association? association? That's association. Association, all right. So again, um, one listen, or more. It, it certainly relaxes my uptightness over this, uh, this change. Um, but I'm open to anybody else. Uh, Vincent, I'm sorry, you, I'm sorry, uh, please. Okay, I don't know if it's, if we should cite within this ordinance the actual National Register criteria for integrity. I mean, uh, these words refer back, there are definitions in term, in the National Register for each of these words, and, um, the, the adding the phrase one or more or a majority of these characteristics shall deem a property uh, eligible for, you know, for uh, class one historic site and or uh, structure of merit uh, site. So I don't know if in the definition section you want to add <laughs> all that language about what the, each of these words mean because then the the whoever the consultant is or um, <clears throat> or the person preparing the nomination will know that the uh, the property has to meet a majority of these classifications in order to be eligible and it would make the board uh, look at the nomination in terms of both a and B uh, so it's just uh, I'm tossing that out uh, okay uh, and I also wonder, um, in terms of uh, this ordinance, is uh, since I don't have the existing ordinance in front of me, uh, does this go back and correct all the language in the existing ordinance? For instance, this new terminology that's new used, does it go back and modify? It, it would replace the okay. existing ordinance okay. in its entirety. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Um, Todd, please. So um, I think this has to be here. It's a critical part of it because it demands discussion of these items and it makes a more thoughtful process of people, you know, whoever these future boards are. And I don't know that, I mean, the Secretary of the Interior does define these and it defines them well. Right. Um, I don't know that it needs to be in the ordinance, but that could be in like a primer that you hand out to new members of the board, say, oh, by the way, if you're not familiar about how these items are defined, here's how the Secretary of the Interior Standards defines them. So when you're talking about these seven or eight different things, here's how, here's what we're using as a guideline. and I. I totally agree with Bill that, um, you know, that I don't think this item, even as it stands, would uh, negate the nomination of the William Holden House. 
I think it just adds for it makes a more thoughtful process that people are not just looking at future boards or not just looking at the items, the seven, they're looking at this also. And so they're having that discussion. I think part of, you know, perhaps the issue that some other people of the public had was maybe there wasn't enough thoughtful discussion of this aspect. Um, and I think it requires or demands and is going to move the discussion in that direction as a okay. part of the process. Well, um, uh, I, I think I have made my point. Um, this is still, this is item one, criteria for the designation of class one historic sites. Provided both of the following findings are met, A and B. And they, neither one is good enough on its own. They have to meet both. So I'm hoping that this language that it's a few word changes here, a little bit of word smithing, relaxes the, in my opinion, the ability of B to override everything on the A list. Mr. Chair? Mr. Lavoie. One or more is one of the lowest thresholds I've ever seen. <laughs> no, I mean, for a landmark? Okay. The mission in Santa Barbara is a landmark, okay? It's not the William Holden House. They're both landmarks. Well, the Santa Barbara has the association of Mr. Lavoie. So. <laughs> that is about to be used as a, as a no, criteria. <laughs> I, I, I won't further the discussion. I think, Flynn, I think you understand what it just needs a little relaxing of that terminology, and if the board is okay with that, um, I would just simply say, is there further discussion on this? Uh, uh, the city's uh, the staff report is to re recommend approval to the city uh, council. Is it ready to go to the city council now, or is there should, should be we see another little secondary draft of this? Uh, I know that they are anxious to see it. I know they are. <laughs> I mean, there's a moratorium, and so there Here, is a... Let me go through the list of proposed changes to the draft ordinance that you have in front of you, and these are in no particular order. It's okay. just how I have them written down and how I will refer to them. Uh, <coughs> Vice Chair Burkett made the comment to add placking as a duty of the Historic Preservation Officer, so I'll add that in. We also had a request to add the definitions of tribal trust land, allotted trust land, and fee lands on the reservation, so that's clear. Um, we had the discussion about integrity, and so I'll make that change to the language there. We also had um, proposed changes to exceptions um, from the Certificate of Appropriateness, uh, the removal to non-character defining features as being the exception and that being the change to language there. And then also the changes to the violations section that under the civil action, the $1,000 per day is until corrected and that we also need to add definitions for non-correctable activities and correctable activities under the violation section. So those are the proposed modifications that I have from the board thus far. Um, I feel that those are relatively easy changes to make, um, and I am comfortable, if you are, with sending these changes forward to the city council. Just in terms of the process, the city council has already designated a subcommittee, and so what would happen is that I would forward this draft ordinance with your changes to the subcommittee. They would then review it and then take it forward to the city council as a whole. So that's the process that would occur from this point forward. Do you need a vote? Uh, I would like to have a vote of the uh, board with the changes as have been read into the record. All right. Then I will move to... Um Recommend approval to the City Council on item 4B uh, with uh, the uh, changes that staff has just indicated uh, that would be made to the uh, draft ordinance. Second. second. All right, let Mr. Marsh is our second on that. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Just a comment. Um, Please. This is a, a terrific. <laughs> addition to the laws of so. the city yeah. of Palm Springs, yeah. I want to commend the subcommittee for their work on, on this and for staff 
for bringing the new ordinance uh, before us. It's a really important part of the whole preservation program for the city. 100% agree. Dick? Uh, well, this has been a, an interesting process uh, been involved from the beginning. I particularly want to thank also Flynn and the staff. Um, you know, this did go back a couple of years, and every month I would bring it up, and I didn't <laughs> understand why it was taking so long, and I was just like, beside, you know, just, but over time, I have learned that there were reasons why this took a while, and that other things need to be put in place. For example, the workload that was increased that, of course, I wasn't thinking about because that wasn't high on my priority list, but in reality, um, it, it was certainly needed to be. Uh, and by having the preservation officer, it makes a huge difference in being able to administer what we wanted to, to happen. So, um, you know, not only did we end up with, with some significant changes and, and requirements um, that have a lot of teeth in them now, but also the uh, historic uh, preservation officer. So um, I'm just really a bit overwhelmed with all of this with joy. Um, it's, it's been a, a long but an interesting ride. And, um, and what I also wanted to mention that I really appreciate um, is the fact that there was that joint, uh, uh, the joining of both the Planning Commission ad hoc subcommittee along with um, HSBB subcommittee that we worked together. And I think that really by doing that, we flushed out a tremendous amount of things. And as Flynn said, we just kept discovering, well, but uh, now we need to go this direction and in that direction. And I would like to see us do more of these, when, it's, when it calls for, these joint meetings with planning. Because there's so many times that we do go hand in hand um, in, in uh, moving things forward. So uh, I just think it's one heck of a great day for, for Palm Springs and for this board. I would add to that, it, w it was very nice to have legal counsel there in the meeting um, rather than, you know, you, you send a document off and they redline everything off of it and leave the period at the end and you go, well, um, so it was really nice having them as part of the team actually in, in, in drafting this ordinance as well as staff's participation. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion on uh, B? We took the vote. You have the yes. returns of that vote? Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, we're moving on to item number five on our agenda. These are discussions, 5A, HSPB number 22, uh, progress update on a facilities report in Plaza Theater. If uh, Mayor Pro Tem shows up, we'll uh, uh, have him take uh, a seat. Uh, but we'll move on to 5B, our modernism show, October 19, 2021. It's just a reminder, staff? That is just a reminder. Um, the Marshall's also made the reminder with more detail, but it is coming up and we will have the HSPB uh, booth at the Modernism Show at the Convention Center. Excellent. And staff, the booth does have these pamphlets that I requested from, and I'm showing them for the audience at home. The booth will have these uh, two informational handouts. Yes. These are valuable, and the reason I asked for them again this morning is because probably most of us are constantly being asked about you know, class one and, and all of the, and the information is really here and it's very succinct and it's something that we can give to anyone asking and uh, they're just valuable resources. So thank you for bringing them for here this morning and those would be at, at, at the booth uh, available to the general public. Yes. Uh, anything else on the Modernism Show? That's it, make sure right. you attend. All right, we'll be there. Uh, 5C Subcommittee for Cornelia White House Project staff. Um, Mr. Chair, I don't have a lot to report on this one, but I did want to bring it forward, and uh, in the coming months, I will provide you with a greater amount of uh, information. But as you know, uh, if I can get this thing to start, come on. Or you could just do. Oh, there we go. Um, so the Cornelia White House has gone undergone the knife. Fabulous. Um, this is the construction wrap, and I want to uh, take a moment and thank uh, staff member Philippe Primera 
for helping me with the graphics on this. Um, it gives a little bit of information about the project, about Cornelia White, about the house, and about the team that's been put together to assemble it. The house has currently been uh, uh -huh. taken apart on the back side, so this is a temporary cover or temporary enclosure because the um, board and batten siding that was on the back part of the house, which is basically the 1914 edition, has been removed. Those boards are now laid in, oh they're uh, all marked and numbered, uh, the boards and the battens uh, along the south side of the construction area, and uh, we're doing some assessments on figuring out which ones of these are going to be um, reusable and which ones are too far gone to really uh, put back in place. Uh, some interesting comments to note, uh, most of what we had assumed and what the consultants had assumed in terms of the uh, structural makeup of the walls of this house were incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> That's of no surprise to any of you, I know. Um, curiously, underneath the board and batten, which are the vertical boards with the narrow strips that were laid over, they found, um, I believe it was one by six tongue and groove, we would call it bead board, and it was laid horizontally, almost like sheathing. Uh, so, well, and even worse than that, uh, we thought there was a two by four stud wall type of conventional stud wall partition in there. Turns out that it was about a two inch by three inch, almost like a furring strip, placed about four feet on center. <laughs> so how this building has stood for this long um, is, is truly a mystery, <laughs> yes. Um, so I'll have more to report on this as well. And I just wanted to show you this is the back of the house where the board and batten cladding has been removed. Uh, and as I say, I'll, I'll bring more to you in the coming months on this. Uh, very briefly, uh, as you know, uh, we're also doing um, a video uh, documentation of this project. Because it is such an unusual project for the city and in general, uh, we think that we're going to have some interesting um, material to, uh, to share with the public. Um, th earlier this week, they began uh, opening up the floor. Uh, as you may recall, the building is sitting on a concrete stem wall uh, footing, if you will, and then it, uh, the middle part of the floor, the area underneath the floor, are, is basically or was basically held up with what you would think of as a trailer jack. Um, concrete blocks and other things kind of shoved up underneath there to kind of hold the floor up. Um, those are all being removed and concrete piers that will be uh, set back in place will be uh, put in place to reinforce that floor. So um, as I say, I'll be bringing more detail forward. Uh, I tried to get some pictures together this morning, but when I went over there, I wasn't able to get anything more fresh. The thing I would like to ask Mr. Chair is, um, there are going to be times when we're going to have some issues come up on this project that we're going to need some immediate decisions on. I'm going to give you an example. Um, I made a decision on this uh, last week. The building apparently had uh, some outdoor porch lights, if you will, that were on uh, by the back door. These porch lights also served as security lighting for the back area of the building. And the contractor encountered them and said, well, what do we do? and came up with an alternative uh, possible replacement light fixture that looked kind of like a little kerosene lantern, if you think of that from like a railroad times. But you know, the house was built in around 1893. There probably wasn't electricity in the house at that time. And so the decision that I made and gave to the contractors was don't put those lights in. There were probably no lights on the house in those locations during its period of significance, so let's not put on a fake or a false interpretive light fixture there that we don't know, it's conjectural, as, uh, is the term that would be used. Uh, that if we have security lighting that we need to place back there, that perhaps it should be pole mounted or some other means to provide good security lighting. But there are going to be those kinds of questions and things that we encounter on the fly that I would like uh, at least a couple or th uh, two or three uh, board members, if you would be available uh, to be m my backup resource to bounce these questions off from, 
so that uh, it's not just me or it's not just staff making decisions on some of these things. I'd like to have the ability to say, hey, this goofy thing has come up. This is how we're thinking about approaching it. Do you concur? So that we can keep the project moving quickly and not be uh, bogged down with um, small problems like this. So would that be something that you would be amenable to having some of the board members uh, yes, help me yes. with? Yes, yes. And Mr. Lavoy just actually volunteered. Okay, so good. no, I think that uh, would one would one person be a good or um, at, at, at least one? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would like to have two, just in case. All right. Uh, well, I'm happy to uh, be a point of okay. reference for at least the remainder of All the right. of the year. Great, I appreciate that. No, and I appreciate it also. Um, any questions of of staff on on this presentation we just saw on the Cornelia White? I think it's fantastic. I really do. I mean, this board has been devoted to this project for quite a long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very pre present downtown a lot, and I was downtown. The, they had just finished putting this wrap up on the fence. I stopped the car. I had to just stop the car, get out. I took a lot of pictures. It was on a Facebook post. It got a lot of very, very, very positive and favorable uh, responses from uh, Facebook people, but I gotta I gotta say the city really hit it out of the ballpark with that banner. It brings a lot of attention. It's colorful. It's entertaining. It's informative. It does so many things. It does so many things. So uh, I think it was terrific. I would think that um, maybe not this presentation, but maybe the next time you've got some more photos. I think a presentation at the council, because a lot of people are sitting home watching the council meetings on television. They see what's going on downtown, and, and this little uh, presentation you did there was, I think, really adding to the whole educational component of, of what we're doing there at the house. Very so good. I think it, it, it should. Uh, see the light of day somewhere else. I'll coordinate with this gentleman here. All right, thank excellent. you. Um, and just to, to make a point on the floor jacks that you or that they found under the house, um, the board is probably familiar that the house, of course, was moved there. I think it was in '79. The architect. Yes, the house has been moved twice actually. Yeah. In its, but to the village green, it was moved in '79. '79, and our local architect William Cody was overseeing that uh, movement of the house. Oh, that I don't know. Time, you know? I'm not certain. Well, there there's some wonderful photos of that house coming down Palm Canyon Drive on the back of a truck. <laughs> but it is. I mean, those are wonderful photographs. And the little jacks are there. Yeah. Under the So they literally just picked it up and they, they just sat... <laughs> They just sat it down on whatever it was that they, that they had used to lift it up and move it. Yes, yes. That's great. Quite That's remarkable. very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Any other questions on, uh, uh, of that on the Cornelia White House? Ken, thank you very much. Oh, uh, may, I, may I just make please. one more quick comment on that? Uh, you may recall um, there was a member of the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation Board who came to one of your meetings several months ago, uh, Steve Kalon, uh, indicating that their board was interested in uh, making a donation toward the cost of the video documentation of this house. And um, Director Fagg put out a, a letter to the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation earlier this week uh, thanking them and acknowledging uh, their um, contribution for the portion of, portion of the funding for the video documentation. Wonderful. Is that video now taking place already? Yes. There's a permanent camera that's mounted oh, at the site that's doing a time lapse. And then as critical moments happen, the film crew is called out you know, a day in advance or so so we can be there as we're opening a wall or as we're digging up something for those either oh aha God. moments or those bumps. oh no this moments. This is so good. <laughs> this is so good. So, yeah. yeah, great. Well, wow, that's great. Thank you. Uh, anything else on the Cornelia White? All right, thank you. We'll move on to um, uh, our board member comments. A board, anything? Please, Todd. I'm oh, sorry. So a um, couple of questions. So that wrap on the Cornelia White House was so incredibly amazing and successful. Um, is there any way to do something like that on the town and country? I get asked about the town and country all the time, and it is so confusing for people as to what that is. And I don't know, like, um, 
I think there's a fence on the back on the Indian Canyon side, but I don't think there's really any possibility for doing anything on the Palm Canyon side because those are active businesses. I, I'll defer this to Director Fagg, but I know that when the fencing was discussed at council level, there was a concern that there be a visible transparency for that chain link fence so that oh. the idea of putting a wrap over it begins to kind of cover up that site where if there's somebody that gets in there that has bad intentions, the police can't see them. Now maybe there's some other way of communicating what the site is about and what the project is about, maybe via a sign. But um, I'll defer that to uh, yeah, Mr. Lyon is correct that the security fencing there was intended for visibility so that we could see if anyone had vaulted over the fence and had gotten in there and shouldn't be in there. And so that's the reason why there is no wrap on the fence. So is there a way to do like a four foot by four foot section or, you know, a four foot or three foot band? Yeah, I so don't like think that that's unreasonable. Two, I mean, there's two feet at the bottom and two feet at the top for people to see through that they could still do something? Because I think that would be a wonderful thing for people to understand what the value is of that center and why it's being done and also what is being done. Mm -hmm. I think much the same way that that's such a, you know, it gets people to stop and look at it and appreciate what's happening. Um, and so if that's possible in some way. So we can ask that, that of be, the property owner. Yeah. Thank and, you. and then the other, one other please, quick thing. No, please take your so, time. Um, you had mentioned uh, changing the word site to resource. Are you changing that across the board or just for the, the ordinance? Across the board in terms of? Well, so, so, so you know, my question is, I, I, I guess, A, is that across the board? And are we going to consider changing the name of this board to historic resource? No. <laughs> OK, well, no. So, so, so it's just you're you're proposing just in the ordinances in, how things correct. read and not correct and not, not how other language where site may appear no. in the similar context. So we'll leave the name okay. of the board the same. Okay. I don't right. want to change too many things. <laughs> and I I actually thought I saw a note in there that um, it's all a historic resource until it receives its class designation and then it becomes a a historic site. So it's a resource until it becomes a historic site. If that's the case, I'll double check and change it. <laughs> well, but, but no, I thought that was a good thing, that a class one historic site has designation. A historic resource is just almost anything that falls within this 35 year. Is that, I see Bill shaking or nodding yeah, his head. Yeah. yeah, I think that's how we understood it. Um, but you'll double check it. Yeah, yeah. all right, excellent. Um, Anything else? Good. Okay. Dick, yeah. please. Um, first thing is on the tennis club mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, to, uh, as far as beginning the process is concerned with the neighborhood meetings, um, is, that, um, is, is that on the schedule coming up for staff? Uh, there was a letter that came from the Historic Tennis right. Club Neighborhood Organization in which they were, uh, it, it seemed to me in reading that it's been a while since I've read it, so I beg your pardon on this, uh, they wanted to sort of hold off a little bit uh, in terms of getting some better understanding. I need to circle back around, uh, Member Burkett, on that and see what that letter said and see how they were looking for us to move forward with it. But I think there was some hesitancy on their part. Uh, so well, I just need to look at that and see right. what it was that they were worried about and how we can. When I read their that questions. letter, I um, it, it became apparent to me that they were saying they, um, as a board, didn't feel that they had that jurisdiction over everything, but that they thought the city would go should go ahead in the city calling for the meetings. So I think they're very and, and then I had some conversation with them afterwards as well. Um, and um, it's not that they're not in favor of it. They just didn't feel that the way they're structured that they could be totally the spokesperson. But they, to me, they were in, encouraging the city to move forward with those with, with the meetings. Yeah. I think their board was saying that they didn't want to stay take a stand one side right. or the other toward right. the establishment of a district. Right. Yeah. Right. But they were all for 
Okay, go ahead, city, and call your meetings yeah. uh, independently that was kind of, of the sense them. I got as well. So I'd I, really like to see that moving. And along. I just haven't had a chance to got it. Pay any attention okay. to that in the last few weeks. All right. Um, and um, what is moving along, I understand, um, Ken, is the Wellwood uh, Murray patio going to the AAC as a package for to get onto their agenda, correct? Yes. Um, the Wellwood Murray Library, the last phase of that project is the restoration of the courtyard. And as you recall, uh, the library board uh, hired a... Veltz, David Veltz, to do a landscape design that was presented to the board. The board had questions and some concerns regarding uh, historic context. And so the library hired Stephen Kalon to do a, a uh, historic assessment of the uh, mm -hmm. Wellwood Murray courtyard and did a pretty good job of digging things up in terms of what that courtyard used to be. Uh, there was a meeting that was held in July. Mm -hmm. um, of the library board, the HSPB board, and the city staff person who was overseeing the project, which was Tom Garcia at the time, who was the director of engineering. He has since left the city. Uh, that meeting, uh, uh, apparently much was discussed. I was not at the meeting, but um, there was difficulty in reaching consensus on a lot of the scope of the library courtyard. So it was requested that the project be uh, submitted to the uh, city's architectural advisory committee right for um, some suggestions and recommendations back to the library and HSPB subcommittees for consideration of bringing in some of the historic characteristics into this um, design. So that is scheduled for uh, the AAC meeting of um, Monday, October 15th. October 15th? Right. That's when that matter will be brought before the AAC. The AAC will be reviewing the current design it will be reviewing the uh, Steve Kalon report, which had some recommendations in it, and then they will be offering their recommendations to the subcommittees, to the joint subcommittees for consideration. Right. What that will then yield is, based on those recommendations, the library, I presume, will make some modifications to the design, and then it will be ready to bring to the full board, the HSPB board, for its final certificate of approval. Right. And our recommendations that our subcommittee made will be sent to the AAC. They're summarized. The, the meeting minutes that were produced by um, uh, Tom Garcia will be included, as well as the um, recommendations that are in the Kalon report, as well as the recommendations that uh, your group put together on right. alternative choices That's for great. possible furnishings. So yeah, it will all yeah. be in there. Good. OK, thank you very much. And um, on La Plaza, um, will that come back to us then next month? I would presume so. We had invited uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Roberts here right. today. I suspect he's always a very, very busy guy and probably just was not able to make it today because I did yeah. contact him yesterday and he did say he was going to join us today. So right. I suspect he probably got uh, sidetracked. Right. And we'll get an assessment at that time yes. about moving forward yes. back to our subcommittee, I'm yes. hoping. Okay. Um, and then uh, I think the other thing is after this, this morning's meeting, and I, I think Gary highlighted it, um, I think that uh, this would be very timely for us to um, invite ourselves, if you will, for the Board of Realtors to have a presentation uh, to, for clarification on what the these definitions mean uh, the the new criteria uh, for uh, demolition and renovation and of course that should probably not happen until after council has decided one way or the other but whatever the decision is I think it would be very helpful for the community because they are the you know some of the first people out there the first responders so to speak um, that at, at the right time that we consider having that, that meeting and also maybe, uh, again, depending upon the outcome of it. Certainly. Uh, I had put together a PowerPoint presentation that was sort of a spin-off of the last workshop that we did as part of last summer's um, Historic Preservation Symposium. 
uh, I can modify that presentation once the city council takes action on these proposed ordinance revisions and take that material back out to the realtors board to give them a refresher on that. I'm happy to do that. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. Um, please, Vincent. Um, <clears throat> just back to the tennis club neighborhood issue. Um, I read that letter and it seemed to me that, I mean, basically their board is putting off any kind of decision until next March or April. Um, as Dick indicated, <coughs> does, can we proceed with an initiation without the board's, um, their uh, neighborhood board's approval? They're um, not a governing board by any means. It's no. just a homeowners association, right. yeah. a neighborhood no, they, board. Th th Actually, they, it's not they, a homeowners association, but it's an yeah. organized neighborhood group of the city of Palm Springs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we, no. They they mentioned that that's when their 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 big meeting was going to be, and I think we could be included in it. But in no way are they in saying that we should hold off until then. We should be moving forward. Uh, right now, and and I mean, reviewing that letter again, I think it's quite obvious. And I know in my follow-up discussions, there's no question that they, that you know, they're they're fine. Uh, that board individually, they're fine with moving this forward uh, from the city doing their their next steps. So I really wouldn't want to see that being thwarted in any way. Okay. And then um, on the Orchard Tree Inn project, are they going to seek their um, reauthorization of the project approvals in November? Yes, they need to do that in the month of November. Otherwise, the entitlements will expire. Okay. I just had a few things, and um, uh, I brought these all up in September. I'll repeat them in October and probably again in uh, November and December. Uh, but I did want to just address the letter from the Historic Tennis Club Organized Neighborhood. I thought the letter, and I'd ask staff to sort of refresh your memories on it, I thought the letter was supportive, but as Dick indicated, they didn't want to be the, they didn't want to carry the water on this. They still felt that the city should go through its natural <coughs> process. Um, and so, like Dick, I, I, whatever it's going to take to kind of at least get the first step made. Uh, the longest journey is taken with one step. Uh, so I do want to, uh, uh, again, I want to really emphasize that the, that the HSPB keep their focus on the historic tennis club neighborhood becoming a historic district. Um, also the uh, La Plaza Theater, uh, this board tasked with city ownership of properties. We've got the Cornelia White House wrapped up and, and going, and this was a long time coming. And I asked in October that this board turn its attention, uh, uh, and, and I know Dick's attention is laser focused, and that's a good thing, on La Plaza. We've got to get the La Plaza Theater up and running and bring 800 people back downtown every single night for whatever it is, a magic show, uh, 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 whatever it might be, whatever it might be. Um, and I'm so happy that Mr. Mayor is in the audience right now. I went to uh, the library. The library has a fantastic series called Palm Springs Speaks. And I went the other night. It's at the Richardson Center, the high school auditorium. That was a full venue. The Palm Springs Historical Society has a, a Palm Springs Talks. There's a Palm Springs Speaks. There's a Palm Springs Talk series. The Talk series is uh, at the historic, uh, not, I'm sorry, at the Cultural Center, at the old Camelot Theaters. I see a cultural renaissance taking place in Palm Springs with Jane Fonda is coming to Palm Springs to, to speak in this series. Um, the, La, the La Plaza Theater should be a venue that is open and operating and attracting um, Michelle Obama to speak. I mean, there's, a, there's so many opportunities and, and we've got the auditorium. Let's keep our focus on that. 
Um, and then again, I'd just like to, and it was in our minutes uh, this week, uh, this month, and I appreciate that, and I meant to comment on it earlier, but I, I floated the idea of tenant improvements on class one properties when and if that business should fail, they have to take with them their tenant improvements. And I don't know where that starts to begin, Flynn, <coughs> where, where. Remind me, please. Yeah, it, whenever we have a certificate of appropriateness coming forward, what we might want to do as a condition of approval of that is identify what is to be removed when the tenant vacates the space. Right. And so it'll just be on a case-by-case -case basis that we do that. Okay. All right, those are, that's it for me. Those are my uh, board member comments. Anything else? No? Excellent. Uh, staff comments. Um, you had asked about uh, the status of the Stan Sandcliff yes, mechanical uh, rooftop units resolution. Uh, there was a subcommittee of Mr. Lavoie, Mr. Hayes, and Ms. Dixon. Uh, the um, Homeowners Association proposed three colors, the color of the building and light light gray and a dark gray, and the subcommittee recommended the light gray. That has been forwarded to the Homeowners Association, and so that work should be implemented uh, in the coming months. So that is resolved. Um, I'm also going to be passing out to you um, a recent application that we received for uh, what is known as the Werner Hogback Residence, otherwise commonly known as 1577 Calle Marcus. Uh, this is an application that's being uh, submitted to the city by the homeowner. And um, what I want to point out to you about this particular application is um, some time ago I had worked on creating a way to streamline class one designation applications. Uh, there's a perception in the community that it's difficult, it's onerous, it's expensive, it's voluminous, it takes horrible amounts of time and so on. It needn't be. And in some cases, like this particular building, which happens to be a Hugh Captor designed post and beam style home from, I believe, 1960, uh, there are instances when an 85 page historic resources report is not necessary, that the building or the sites or the resources credentials are quite clear and have already been well documented. In those cases, we may be able to bring forward what I will call a simplified or abbreviated application. And that's what you're gonna see in what I'm handing out today. So this is an application for a class one nomination of 1577 Calle Marcus. It's a single family residence in the Deepwell neighborhood designed by Hugh Captor. I'll pass the material out to you. Over the coming weeks, we will schedule site visits with you as we always do. And then we will try to bring this to a public hearing at the November HSPB meeting. And can this is an example of an abbreviated? Yes. Okay. Yes. No, I wanted to be clear on that. Um, while you're passing those out, um, uh, I'm assuming that the uh, Sandcliff HVAC units on the roof painted in this light gray will be successful. And based upon that, can we work something can this be an option provided to a homeowner or a, a condominium developer, or not developer, but association where instead of the required screening, will this become an option of the units being colored, uh, painted a light gray in lieu of, of required screening can we, if it is successful, do we think it's going to be successful? I believe it's going to be successful. Uh, the gray wouldn't have been the first color I chose, but that doesn't matter. The way that the ordinance is written on uh, mechanical screening of rooftop units is that the screening must be integral with the architecture of the building on which it is placed, subject to the discretion of the director of planning. So when we have these kinds of instances come along where there may be an alternative way of resolving this issue. The director has the discretion to refer it to the HSPB, okay. or if it's non-historic, they could refer it to the AAC. And that's happened in the past. 
you have also considered this type of situation on the um, City National Bank building, the uh, Bank of America building, if you recall, a year or two ago. Uh, that one had a bit of a well in which the mechanical units were placed, so the screening was not necessary there. Um, the other one that's probably um, more familiar to you is the uh, uh, Takwitz Plaza mm -hmm. buildings, uh, where there is some screening work ongoing. And um, before those buildings had been granted their Class One designation, there was screening already on the rooftop. And so what you did in that case was to require the uh, building owner to continue in a consistent manner the mechanical screening that had previously been installed. So mechanical screening of rooftop mechanical units is required by the city's ordinance. It is in required to be integral with the architecture of the building and the director of planning has the discretion to refer it to a border committee for further consideration of alternatives. All right, no, and I appreciate that explanation. I thought it was such a good solution. I did. Um, sometimes I think that the boxy screening is more uh, distracting to the eye than the actual sc uh, unit. So uh, just, you know, if you would keep it under at your discretion, Mr. Director. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other uh, staff? That's all I have. Okay. I have one. Please. <laughs> As I alluded to in my presentation earlier, we have an additional staff position, that of the Historic Preservation Officer. Uh, we had an interview panel a couple of weeks ago. Vice Chair Burkett sat on that panel with me, and uh, we had a number of qualified applicants. However, we have selected Mr. Lyon to be our Historic Preservation Officer. And while this is a lateral move for Mr. Lyon, I think that he will do a fantastic job in administering our Historic Preservation Program. So just wanted to announce that to the board. Well, congratulations, Ken. No, absolutely, a little applause for you. Um, you've certainly been um, leading, consulting, instructing uh, this board for at least five years that I know of. Uh, I can't imagine that there is anybody else with the knowledge at your fingertips that you already have. Um, so congratulations. Thank you very much, and I, I really do enjoy this work. I look forward to continuing working with you all. Great, great, you. excellent. Anything else, board? All right, so we did miss Mr. Roberts, and so maybe in November, okay? All right, then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. Thank you.